Hey class, so there are two weeks left until spring break this week and next week. Uh, and then you have until Thursday to submit your exam one. And you'll get one more homework. Uh, and then I won't assign any anything, any work over spring break. Um, and then uh, I'm not sure how many homeworks we'll have the rest of the way, but obviously there's still two exams remaining. Uh, so my hope is that before spring break uh, happens that we'll be able to finish the the main thrust of the material uh, for the semester and then we'll spend the second half uh, going over uh, practical examples, uh, spending a lot of time writing code, uh, potentially in C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Python, um, and then uh, I would also like to spend a little bit of time uh, looking over uh, the material related to what we're going to cover today, uh, databases, and so we're going to look at relations, and as we discuss relations, I want you to keep in the back of your mind the idea of a relational database. Uh, so you're not necessarily dealing with these mathematical functions which map from A to B. Uh, you are dealing with uh, records in these cases, so it, it can mean in the context that we discuss it, uh, it can mean either uh, something in a pre-image and something in an image, uh, as you would get with a function, f of x equals whatever, right, x squared or whatever. Uh, that is a type of relation. Uh, or it can mean uh, that a, all of this data is related to a particular user or a particular student, which can be indexed and referenced by the user ID or student ID or whatever unique identifier. So uh, keep that in the back of your mind as we discuss this and then uh, again hopefully uh, a little later in the semester we'll be able to look at some practical example of a relational database uh, setup. Uh, and then uh, in addition to the practical examples hopefully we'll have time to go over uh, methods of proofs and, and how to approach uh, difficult problems uh, whenever that comes up. Uh, and uh, I would like to do this quickly enough that, that we have uh, time for uh, just whatever fits in. Right? Uh, those, uh, the freeform projects tend to be the most fun in, in my estimation. Um, so let's jump into it. <laughs> Hopefully uh, we could do something better than slog through the last uh, four chapters or, or whatever it is that we have left, three or four chapters. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, okay, so uh, we begin with a few definitions. Uh, as with any new content, uh, we start by developing a vocabulary for it, and then uh, once we've established uh, some ground rules, uh, some definitions, then uh, we'll build on top of that with some theory uh, and concepts. Uh, okay, so beginning with uh, building our vocabulary, uh, let A and B be sets then a binary relation from A to B is a subset of A cross B, or A times B, or the product of A and B, however you want to say that. A uh, relation on a set A is a relation from A to A, uh, so this is just synonymous, a, a shorthand way, or maybe not <laughs> a shorthand way, but uh, so uh, if you consider the set of real numbers, then uh, a relation would map from the real numbers to the real numbers. So we would just say that it's a relation on the real numbers. Uh, okay, uh, a relation R on a set A is called reflexive if uh, the pair A and A uh, is in uh, the relation R for every element A in A, right? Uh, so, <laughs> This one, in this context, it's easier to think about the relational database uh, or um, uh, something we haven't discussed, but uh, adjacency matrices or uh, graphs uh, where you have something that is uh, self-referential. Uh, so, um, or uh, another way to think about it, uh, so typically trees would not have self-references. Uh, except that file systems are one representation of a tree structure uh, and they have they satisfy this reflexive property 
uh, where uh, <laughs> even in Windows, uh, you can if you go to the command line and you use uh, you refer to dot slash uh, dot four slash forward slash in uh, you know Linux or or Mac or uh, dot backslash in Windows, then uh, then it is both a directory uh, which is related to the current directory and then it satisfies this requirement that it refers to itself so every directory refers to itself so file systems are an example of uh, of a tree structure and a tree structure is certainly a relation uh, which satisfies this reflexive property uh, and which is also <laughs> breaks it from the strict definition of a tree structure so I have to be a little bit careful of that uh, but the uh, I suppose if we were to define a, a relation that navigates a tree structure then we could say that the the tree uh, is a, a data structure which uh, you know uh, describes a file system uh, and there is some function which allows you to navigate the tree uh, and that function or that relation uh, is what actually has the reflexive property so uh, sometimes in order to get <laughs> these things or, or these concepts that we really want to describe uh, we have to be uh, a little strict in the, the nomenclature or terminology that we use to describe it um, but you know that is anyway that's an example of, of the reflexive property that we're talking about so where something just refers to itself um, in any social network uh, you would be considered to be aware of yourself you would uh, whether or not um, you know you, uh, <laughs> you you consider yourself your own best friend or, or whatever uh, you uh, <laughs> in any uh, network or, or any um, computer or machine representation of a, a social network you would be considered to know yourself right so that would be that reflexive property uh, okay so uh, we will uh, <laughs> ignore the case where uh, where uh, perhaps you're in a vegetative state and maybe you're, <laughs> you're present and, and people know you but you don't you're not conscious of yourself um, you know let's uh, Let's leave those edge cases out of it. So in general, that would satisfy the reflexive property as well. Uh, okay. Uh, so then uh, the next definition: a relation R on a set A is called symmetric uh, if, whenever uh, the point or the pair B A is in R, is in our relation, or rather, whenever the point A B is in our relation, then the pair BA is also in the relation, right? So there's that symmetry property. Uh, and that was also a question on the exam. Um, anyway, uh, and if that holds for every AB, that's an A, right? Uh, and so uh, friendship is something that we would consider to be symmetric as well, particularly in something like Facebook or uh, other social networks. Uh, so the friend request is sent and then it's uh, accepted or declined. And if it's accepted, then you become their friend and they become your friend, right? So then we have this symmetric property uh, that's satisfied in that case. Uh, but also friendship, the concept in general, is something we would consider to be symmetric as well. Uh, it's uh, it's um, a little <laughs> depressing concept to consider you know, that someone might have a friend who does not in return consider them a friend, right? Uh, so typically we would say, you know, whenever they are friends, it it's, goes in either direction. Uh, person A is, or Alice is Bob's friend, and Bob is, is Alice's friend as well. Okay. Uh, okay, so a relation R on a set A such that for uh, any two points in our set A, so or any two members, A and B, of our set A, uh, if a, a B is in our relation and the symmetric pairing B A is in the relation uh, then A is equal to B is called anti-symmetric um, so uh, this would be uh, something that you would see uh, in the case of um, uh, identity right or uh, 
I'm trying to think of something that's more vague, right? Like group identity, uh, so that uh, you could say that they're in the same group, right? If if A and B are both in the same group, uh, then A and B in the relation, and B A in the relation, then the group of A is equal to the group of B. Um, but uh, it's uh, th this is a very subtly strict requirement, right? And, and again, this is by definition. So we say that you have anti-symmetry if you satisfy this. Uh, and so I would encourage you to, you know, think for a moment on scenarios where, you know, that that might be the case. Um, but uh, this is typically, uh, you know, something that you would see in uh, perhaps uh, in, in, well, yeah, in, in an equivalence relation where you're saying that, uh, okay, the only time that you have this symmetry where A relates to B and B relates to A uh, is if uh, A is equal to B, right? So uh, think of the case where the relation uh, is defined by less than or equal to. So if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, well, it can't be that A is less than B and B is less than A. So the only time that's satisfied is whenever we have equality. Right, so anti-symmetry, um, you know, it it provides this guarantee that if it's symmetric, then it's because of equality. Right, so uh, okay. Uh, so definition. Uh, oh, um, and so whenever a equals b, so if you have that, uh, then it's reflexive, right? So uh, if you have that for every point in the system, whenever a is b, then uh, then you have something that's also reflexive as well, right? And that, again, would feed into the concept of a, an equivalence relation. Uh, okay, so uh, a relation R on a set A is called transitive if uh, whenever uh, the pair, uh, or uh, if whenever A relates to B and B relates to C, then A relates to C for any triples A, B, and C in our original set A. Right? Um, so uh, an example of a transitive relation is the, the ordering operation, right? So less than. So if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C, right? So less than is a transitive operation or a transitive relation. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, next definition. Uh, let R be a relation uh, from a set uh, from set A to set B, and S uh, is a relation from B to C. Then the composite of R and S is a relation consisting of the ordered pairs uh, A C, uh, where A is in A and C is in C. Uh, okay, so um, this is again this is by definition, but we're just saying that uh, you can use shorthand, right? So uh, if you have to jump through a couple of hoops, um, but you're given that you have uh, something that maps from A to B, and then something that maps from B to C, well, you're mapping from here, from here to here, right? Because B is the same set here as it is here. And, and then this is taking this and mapping it to C. Um, so, uh, for example, <laughs> I'm trying to think of uh, you know, decent examples here. Um, uh, it, ignoring the relation, just the, the concept of a, a composite operation, um, uh, changing the temperature between Celsius and Fahrenheit is uh, something that would be considered a, a composite operation. So to go from, uh, so we know that uh, freezing occurs at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and zero degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, so the conversion, uh, just <laughs> it's something that we know, uh, is that it's um, to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, it's uh, nine fifths the temperature times the temperature in Celsius plus 32. Uh, and then to go in the other direction, uh, it's uh, minus 32 
and then times five nights. And so those are two separate operations. And so we go from uh, from real numbers, right? <laughs> so whenever we perform the multiplication, we go from the real numbers to the real numbers, and then we perform the addition, and we go from the real numbers to the real numbers. So you could say that you know really you're just you're performing the two operations in succession. So it's this composite operation. So you can say that you're going from A to B and then B to C, or you can say that you're going straight from A to C, right? Um, and then you can combine, define this composite function, which is composed of the two individual operations that are being performed. Okay. Um, so uh, that concept of just shorthanding these or combining multiple uh, relations into a single one uh, into a single composite relation uh, exists for uh, relations in general, not just uh, functions which convert temperature. Okay, uh, so now uh, we define uh, this uh, relation from uh, R on the set A, some generic set A, uh, then the powers R to the N by definition, where n is some natural number, 1, 2, 3, etc., are defined recursively, where r1 is equal to r, and r to the n plus 1 is equal to r to the n composed of r. Right? Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, if you repeatedly apply a relation, then you can denote it this, uh, this way. Uh, and so we might use that for transitive closures and such, or we will use that whenever we discuss uh, transitive closures where you you represent the the relations in terms of a matrix and then you repeatedly multiply that matrix by itself until you reach some certain property uh, and then uh, and then uh, anything that isn't zero <laughs> uh, has a, a path where you can travel from, uh, if you look at the relations as uh, roads connecting cities, then the cities are connected, they're path connected, if the, the transitive closure, if after you've multiplied that matrix by itself, however many times, right, however many hops of cities you're willing to take, uh, or um, however many gas refills or whatever, right, uh, then uh, then they are uh, connected in the closure. Okay. Uh, so whenever you see this, whenever you see a relation, uh, think of the relation in that context as being represented by a matrix, uh, and then this exponent means however many times you multiplied that matrix by itself. And so uh, just keep in mind that it can be represented as a matrix, and we will take a look at that, at, at what that means in just a little bit. Uh, okay, so now the relation R on some set A is transitive if and only if uh, R to the N, so the relation R is a matrix and you've multiplied by, it, by itself N times, uh, if and only if this is a subset of R uh, of the original matrix. Uh, okay. Um, right. Uh, and so it's possible uh, to construct a, uh, a relation or uh, some matrix such that um, this uh, this expands, uh, which is what we'll look at whenever we look at the transitive closures. Uh, and so, uh, sorry, I'm uh, I'm dealing with my own doubt in the notation here. I'm trying to remember if this is correct or if this should actually be reversed. Um, but uh, we will find out whenever we get there, right? Um, but uh, uh, we'll have to double check this. If uh, you're in doubt yourself, uh, go to this page number in the book, in the textbook, and uh, verify that I haven't uh, gotten this part backwards. Uh, but one way or another, we will see whenever we get to the method for identifying transitive closures. Uh, okay. Uh, so. Uh, now in area relations and their applications. Uh, okay, so now we have some collection of sets A1 through AN uh, and we define some in area relation on these uh, 
sets, and it's a subset of this, cross this, cross this, or whatever. Uh, so you have seen notation like this before. Uh, so if you allow each of these to be the real numbers, right, uh, then uh, some in area relation uh, takes uh, like if uh, we're dealing with R3, right, so that you have points in uh, in three space, uh, then uh, these are the real numbers, real numbers, and so you take any two points in the plane and then you can get some third value, uh, which is again some real number, uh, and then you get a tuple, or you can deal with something uh, where uh, any point in space, like any point in a room, if you were to create a coordinate system, then you would have, um, you know, an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis, and any any point in the room uh, would have a, a temperature that could be measured, and that would give you some fourth uh, value, some fourth real number. And then your relation would be uh, the relationship uh, between those points in space and the temperature, uh, which is some real value. Uh, okay, so then uh, we're still on definition, but that's the concept of an in area relation. So then the sets uh, are in number of sets, A1 through AN, are called the domains of the relation, and N is called its degree. Uh, okay, so you'll hear degree interchangeably, and it's just talking about uh, you know, the power or <laughs> whatever, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, um, sometimes you'll hear it as dimensions, right? So we're dealing with three dimensions of space, right? Uh, in that case, the degree is actually three, right? Uh, but you're probably more familiar with hearing it as referred to as a dimension in that case. Uh, but from uh, going forward, it won't be uncommon to hear degree instead. Uh, okay, so let R be an in area relation and C a condition that uh, elements in R satisfy. Then the selection operator SC, uh, where we're selecting based on condition C, maps uh, our in area relation R to the in area relation of all in tuples from R that satisfy the condition C. Uh, okay, so that's extremely formal. So I want you to think back to the exam uh, where we had the uh, the table with student records. Uh, okay, so if I recall, then that table had four fields, uh, and so it was a degree four relation uh, where every record had four fields, right? And so we're not necessarily dealing with numbers anymore. Uh, I think we had a student ID, a student name, a student uh, major, uh, and a GPA. So there were four fields, right? Uh, so we were dealing with sets of uh, four uh, sets, right? Uh, and then uh, we were able to provide a selection operator, right? Our the SQL syntax that we use select, uh, you know, the fields that we want from uh, the uh, in area relation that we want, so from the table uh, where some condition is satisfying. Right? So we have this and we can refer to it as a selection operator uh, and we have this very formal definition or you can just think that um, you know we can define uh, in, in terms of relations we, we can define some way to pull just the data that we want that's really all that we're saying here. Uh, and the thing uh, in, in this context, uh, the thing that specifies what we want is the selection operator uh, SC, where S is the operator and the subscript C indicates that we are specifying some condition or we're specifying a where clause or a where condition. Uh, and then uh, it, whenever we look at SQL later on, there are actually other uh, types of operations that we can, or conditions that we can specify. Uh, so you can perform group operations where you uh, where you divvy up uh, records into certain uh, groups or you know categories or whatever you want to call them. 
or you know these smaller sets uh, and so uh, you could group them by first letter of last name or, or something like that or group them by major or whatever uh, and then uh, you want to throw out uh, just so you want to find out which uh, group has the highest cumulative GPA or highest average GPA uh, and so you want to throw out all of the kids that have withdrawn in the last semester or something like that. All of the kids that are not currently registered. Uh, so then that would be your where condition. Uh, and then um, you, know, you throw out all of the majors that uh, collectively have a GPA under 3.0 or something like that. Uh, so then uh, that wouldn't be specified in the where clause, that would be specified after the group by <laughs> uh, uh, clause and then in, in a, a having clause uh, and so we will take a look at that it's uh, a little bit more advanced but uh, I think it's always nice to be exposed to some of these more complicated ideas early on uh, not to uh, discourage you or to make you think that you know it, it goes on forever but uh, you know for the exact opposite reason to show uh, okay well this is it this is everything that there is and once you master this then uh, then you're really you know off to the races there's not a whole lot more to learn it's just uh, you know learning how to uh, think intuitively about these concepts uh, okay uh, so selection operator uh, projection so again on the, on the exam we're doing a projection we're just not doing it so formally so we're given four fields and we project it down to three fields. We're selecting only three fields. Well, that is a projection. So uh, we, uh, we map this larger tuple or this record uh, down to some smaller tuple, right, where the number of fields we selected is less than uh, the number of fields there were originally. Uh, okay. Uh, and then the join operator, so this is something that we'll look at whenever we do the practical example, but uh, this one is not on the exam. Uh, but if you have multiple tables, or here, they call them relations, but uh, whenever it is clearly to the advantage to view these in terms of uh, database tables or relational database tables, I'll just say that, right? So you have uh, some table R and some table S, right? Table R has M fields, and Table S has N fields. Right? Uh, then the join uh, of those two tables, uh, where P is less than or equal to M and less than or equal to N, is a relation of degree M plus N minus P that consists of all tuples M plus N minus P. Right? Um, and so here, P is essentially the overlap right? uh, it's taking a long time to say that right so we talked about the principle of inclusion and exclusion and how uh, things get repeated right things can get repeated um, but one of the things that you'll see whenever we start working with databases a lot more is that uh, every table has some ID right and uh, a a common convention uh, for naming the fields in those is, uh, or for managing them, is to give every table its own unique identifier. Right. So if you have a users table, then you have a users ID table, or if it's a user table, then it's a user ID. Uh, sorry, uh, if you have a users table, then you have a users ID column, uh, or if it's the user table, then it is a user ID column. Uh, if you have a courses table, then there's a courses ID column, whatever. And so it's table name with ID at the end. Uh, and it's just a serial number so that you can, uh, you can specifically invoke that particular record anytime you want. Uh, and so some of the data will be uh, uh, so specific that nothing will ever refer to it unless you are manually going in and performing some data cleanup operation. Uh, but a lot of the data is reused and so the advantage of having the relational database is that you take this data that everyone is going to be reusing. Say 
uh, course information. So you can have uh, you know a hundred people registered to the exact same course and so repeating all of the data for that course like the instructor's name, the classroom, and so on and so forth uh, it's just so repetitive that it makes more sense to put that data in a separate table and write it once and then refer to that serial number to say okay well this is the course ID whatever so this student is enrolled in this course ID right? uh, and so then you end up dealing with these keys or these primary keys right so in this example the overlap uh, so we have all of the unique information here right uh, the M minus P and then all of the unique information here from that second table so this would be all of the students unique information this would be all of the course information and then this would be the overlap where we specify uh, the course ID so it can be more than a single column and so this just says okay well however many columns it takes to generate that key to generate that overlap then that is also going to be in there and so now this definition is just saying that whenever you perform uh, these uh, these join operations to combine data that was separated originally for a perfectly reasonable uh, uh, purpose you know so that we're not repeating data hundreds of times unnecessarily or in the end thousands or millions of times unnecessarily um, so uh, then you'll have some keys uh, which uh, is the unique identifier to this table but over here it's a foreign key so that it just says uh, so all of this unique information and oh yeah uh, the stuff that's specified over here but you just include the serial number instead of uh, instead of all the information uh, so it's uh, you can think of it like a, a card catalog in a library uh, right, where you have some reference to a book number and so the power of the catalog is that it doesn't repeat the entire book. You don't have to search the entire library. It's just a reference number, right? You know exactly where to go for everything contained inside that book. Same concept. Uh, okay, so the M tuple here, right? And so this overlaps is all it's saying. Uh, and then you have the uh, N tuple over here again with that overlap, where this is some primary key and this is some foreign key, right? and then. So this belongs to R, and then this belongs to S. Right. Uh, okay, so joins are performed using some overlapping information. That's all that that says. Okay, the count of an item set. Uh, uh, let's just skip this one. I'm not going to test you over it. Uh, and same here. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, so now representing relations. So I said that we would get to some representation where it's in a matrix form. Uh, so here we are. So a relation between finite sets can be represented. Oh, why? Uh, okay, I apologize for any typos such as this. A relation between finite sets can be represented using a zero one matrix. So suppose that R is a relation from A, uh, which can, is, consists of these fields, to B, which consists of these fields. Then the relation R can be represented by the matrix uh, M subscript R. Right? So the matrix M with this relation, uh, where the entries M, I, J are a 1 if the two are related, and a 0 if not. Right? So for example, Consider the set A equals 1, 2, 3, and the set B equals 1, 2. And then let R be the relation from A to B containing A, B. If A is a member of the large, of capital A, right, and little b is a member of capital B, right, uh, and A is greater than, than B, right, then our matrix is given by this, right? So this defines our relation. Uh, and then this is the matrix which represents this. Right? Um, and so you have uh, the first set is the uh, the rows of the matrix, and the second set is the columns of the matrix. Uh, and then uh, for each entry in there, you have your comparison, right? 
So the relation is that A is greater than B, right? So true or false, right? So A1 is greater than B1, true or false? Well, is one greater than one? No, so it's a zero. A1 is greater than B2. Is one greater than two? No, so that's a zero. A2 is greater than B1. Is two greater than one? Yes, so that's a one. And so on and so forth, right? So so we have this this relation operator, operator uh, and then uh, we can use it uh, combining the sets to construct a, a matrix which defines the, the relation. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, uh, more generically, let A be some set with members A1, 2, and 3, and B uh, is a set with members B1 through 5. Then let R be given by the matrix MR as this. And then uh, we can represent it as a matrix, right? And so this is, sorry, we're given this, uh, we, we don't have any, uh, we're not given the relation R here and we're not given specific values uh, for the sets A and B. These are just placeholder values essentially. Uh, but we're given the relationship matrix. Right? Uh, and then uh, this, uh, example states that well uh, not only can you define it in terms of a matrix but you can go back and forth between this representation uh, and this representation where we have the relation R uh, and then we're given all of the the points or the the pairs uh, that are in the relation right? and so if it's a one then it's over here right? if the matrix representation has a one for uh, example a1 b2 right uh, then it shows up in this set notation over here right? okay and so uh, just these are equivalent okay. uh, so now we talk about directed graphs uh, I kind of refuse to call them digraphs but the book insists that some people do call them that uh, so uh, the directed graph um, consists of, or a directed graph consists of a set of vertices, we'll call them V, uh, or nodes if you want to call them nodes, uh, and a set of edges, we'll call them E, uh, where the edges are ordered pairs of vertices. Okay. Uh, so then the vertex A is called the initial vertex of the edge AB, so we draw from A to B, okay. and the vertex B it's called the terminal vertex of this edge. Right? So that's by definition, and uh, you have an example of a directed graph on the exam, right? So from source to destination, uh, and directed graphs are a pairing of vertices uh, and edges, right? So we define all of the the nodes on the graph, uh, and then uh, we say which ones are connected. Uh, and in the case of a directed graph, um, the direction of that connection is indicated uh, in this notation from source to destination. Okay. okay. So closures of relations. So uh, there's only a few. If R is a relation on a set A, then the closure of R with respect to some property P, if it exists, is there a relation, uh, well, I say there's only a few. There's only uh, a few that we're going to discuss, uh, but um, closures are an interesting topic in general, but we uh, are barely going to uh, really discuss them. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, the closure of R with respect to some property P, if it exists, is a relation, uh, so some relation S, on A with property P that contains R and is a subset of every subset A cross A containing R with property P. Uh, yeah, so that's one where the definition isn't terribly helpful. So let's take a look at an example. So the reflexive closure of a set R uh, is the relation S which contains R. So uh, the I guess the thing that we should be getting from this uh, 
is that we start with some uh, relations or some set of pairings or um, you know uh, things where A and B are connected and then we extend it to some larger relation uh, which fully contains that original one so the closure it's it's everything that we had before and all of the things that we should have so um, so if we were to do like an adjacency matrix uh, to show all of the major cities in Texas uh, then we would see that Dallas connects directly to Austin via I-35 and Austin connects to San Antonio um, but technically speaking there is no direct route from Dallas to San Antonio you have to go through Austin right? so the original relation uh, did not contain a connecting path between Dallas and Austin but the, the uh, transitive closure Yeah, whatever, we'll get to it eventually. The transitive closure does, uh, where uh, we say that uh, if you can get from A to B and then from B to C, then you can get from A to C. Right? Uh, so in that sense, Dallas to Houston, or sorry, Dallas to San Antonio does exist as a, a path. Uh, and so in that case, the closure is really what you want to discuss, not necessarily the uh, relation. Okay. So reflex, reflexive closure uh, on a set R is the relation to S, which contains R with the added property that S is reflexive. So that is, uh, if A is a member of the set A, uh, then uh, the point AA, so A relates to itself, is in that closure S. Right? For example, uh, you have the relation R, which is the set of all pairings A and B, where A is less than B, and A and B are both natural numbers, or sorry, are both integers, so positive or negative integers. Then the reflexive closure is uh, R union delta. Right? So before we had everything that was less than, and now we're going to add, we're going to uh, union that with the set of all reflexive points. Um, of natural number or of integers, uh, so now we have this less than or equal to as our relation. Right? So this is the uh, reflexive closure of uh, this relation or uh, that property. Right? Uh, okay, so then uh, this is our new relation S. Okay, so symmetric closure is a similar concept. So we're going to start. With some relation uh, and then we're going to extend it to a larger relation or a broader scoped relation uh, with the added property P. Okay. Uh, so, that is, so since we're looking for symmetric uh, then if A relates to B then B relates to A. Okay. So for example uh, we have uh, greater than right so uh, the set of all pairings of natural numbers uh, so positive integers, um, a b where a is greater than b. Okay. The symmetric closure uh, is going to be the pairings uh, b a where a is less than b, or you could say where b uh, where a is greater than b, or you could say where b is less than a. Right? Uh, and so that closure is actually the not equal to. Right. So if it's either greater than uh, or less than. Uh, then it's uh, not equal to, right? and so that is our new uh, relation. Okay, so now um, we define a path, a directed graph. So a path from point A to point B in the directed graph G is a sequence of edges x0, uh, x1 so from uh, Dallas to Austin, Austin to San Antonio uh, and so on and so forth down to Brownsville right? um, so uh, n is greater than or equal to 1 right? so we're counting forward 
So we start here, we go here, then from there to there, and then from there, and so on. Right? A, a series of, of hops. Uh, so, but we always pick up where we left off. Uh, that is, a path is a sequence of edges where the terminal vertex of an edge is the same as the initial vertex of the next in the next edge in the path. This path is denoted by this sequence and has length n. Right? So we're counting the number of hops, not the number of miles traveled. Uh, uh, note that this w ah, note that with this convention. We view the empty set of edges as a path of length 0 from A to A. Uh, so a path of length n greater than or equal to 1 that begins and ends at the same vertex is called a circuit or a cycle. Um, so, or you can think of it as a round trip if we're going to discuss this in terms of uh, driving on roads. So from Dallas to Austin, then Austin back to Dallas. Alright, so theorem. Uh, let's have some relation R, which is defined on A. Then uh, there is a path of length N, where N uh, is a positive integer from A to B, if and only if AB is in uh, R to the N. Right? And remember, this is matrix multiplication. So uh, whatever our matrix is, M sub R uh, to the nth power. So we've multiplied it by itself n times, and then we can see whether or not there's a path that connects, uh, you know, Dallas to San Antonio um, of length n uh, if uh, if that path is in there. So matrices naturally lend themselves to uh, computing these these lengths uh, in terms of. Uh, So let uh, R be a relation on a set A. So this is another definition out of here. Uh, then the connectivity relation R star consists of the pairs A B such that there is a length of path or is a path of length at least one from A to B in R. Um, because R to the N consists of pairs A B such that there is a path of length N from A to B. It follows that R star is the union of all sets R and the N. Uh, in other words, R star is equal to the union of each iteration of these. So if we have, uh, you know, uh, 10 cities or whatever that we're considering and we're saying, uh, you know, construct the matrix if the cities are joined directly by some highway. Uh, then if you take the entire family of those matrices raised to some power, uh, so the original matrix, and then you square it, and you perform the union with that original matrix, and then you take the cube, and you perform the union uh, of the output of uh, the union of the first two matrices, and so on and so forth, then this, R star, uh, tells you whether or not two points are path connected. Essentially, so uh, if uh, if they are connected through some iteration <laughs> of the uh, of this, right? Uh, if if some uh, exponented <laughs> exponentiated version of the uh, adjacency matrix indicates that they are path connected, then they are path connected, right? So uh, just consider them all as a set say okay well if it's ever path connected then it's in our connectivity relation r star uh, which makes sense whenever you're discussing things like highway connectivity uh, or um, like computer network connectivity uh, if uh, if they can see each other regardless of how many uh, hops or stops it took then you can drive there or you can send data from one computer to the next uh, okay, so uh, we'll call that R star. All right, so now we have a theorem on that. The transitive closure of relation R equals the connectivity relation R star. Okay, so we had reflexive and symmetric closures right off the bat, and now we have transitive closures. Uh, and so the transitive closure just says that 
uh, if things are ever connected, right, then that is the transit of closure. Uh, then they, they show up in that relation. It's a R star. Okay. Uh, so, lemma. Let A be a set with N elements, and let R be a relation on A. If there is a path of at least one in R from A to B, then there is such a path with link not exceeding N. Moreover, when A is not equal to B, if there is a path of at least one in R from A to B, then there is such a path with length not exceeding N minus one. Um, so it just caps the number of uh, exponents or whatever, that, that you, the number of times you have to multiply that matrix by itself uh, in order to determine whether or not two things are path connected. Uh, so if we're considering 10 cities, then you never have to go past the 10th power of the matrix. Uh, or if you reach a point where you're exponentiating it and it stops changing, uh, then you have also uh, reached the transit of closure, even if you haven't reached this level n. Uh, okay, so, uh, so this is uh, just another way of writing this union operation. Uh, so now we construct that zero one matrix as before. So we say, you know, you line up the cities on the rows and on the columns, and if there's a road, a path connecting them, then it's a one, and if there's no connection, then it's a zero. So here you're taking these matrices to the power, whatever, and these are bitwise operators. Right? So now you're saying that if it's one for any uh, version of these exponentiated adjacency matrices, then it's one in the transitive closure. Okay. Uh, so this is just a, a bitwise operation between the matrices. So it's, um, but we've listed it as a theorem. Um, okay. All right. For example, uh, so we start with this zero one matrix uh, to compute the transitive closure on MR. Uh, so this is just what we're given to start with. We don't know what the relation is R, but we know that this is the matrix representation of it. Uh, and then by the above theorem, it follows that the zero one matrix of R star is given by this, right? So we started with this, so we square it to get this. We multiply it by itself, and that yields this. And then we multiply this times this to get the cube, right? the matrix cube. And we see that there was no change, so uh, there's not a lot going on there. Uh, and then the transitive closure is computed by the bitwise uh, or operator. Right? So this or this or this is one, and so on and so forth. The only one that changes from the original is this one. So this or this or this is one. Right? Uh, so that is our transitive closure. OK, fair chance that's on the second exam. Uh, okay. Uh, so now we discuss equivalence relations. So a relation on a set A is called an equivalence relation if it is at the same time reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Uh, and so equivalence relations, uh, you know, it seems like we go through a lot of trouble um, to define what this is, but uh, it it formalizes this abstract con concept of equality. So um, if you think of just two numbers, right? Uh, like the number, uh, or you're given some relation, um, uh, y equals x, right? Uh, so <laughs> you're drawing the straight line, you're given all of these ordered pairs, uh, some x value and some y value, uh, then, uh, that is both reflexive, right? X equals Y at every point. It's symmetric. Uh, if you're given some point, then Y equals X is also symmetric and it's transitive. Um, so that if uh, A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And so it's just another way of, of defining equivalence, right? So you start with the X direction and now you have the same values in the Y direction. Uh, so it is an equivalent representation. 
but it's not interesting. The more interesting ones are whenever we deal with uh, modular arithmetic and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, you're, say you're uh, dividing by some, or you're taking the modulus with respect to some uh, prime number with 100 digits. And then you can say, okay, uh, so uh, <laughs> we're using equivalence relations in that case instead of equality. We say that uh, addition operations on uh, something that has a remainder when divided by this 100-digit prime uh, of x uh, is the same as x plus that 100-digit prime, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that if you're multiplying and it satisfies those properties, if they're in a, an equivalence class with one another, uh, then um, uh, then you can say that any operations on them, uh, uh, any operations are the same as if you had operated on some other number. And so in, in the way that it's done, you actually go beyond the, the number that you're taking the modulus with respect to, so that 100 digit prime, or the product of two primes, each of 100 digits, uh, and then um, that allows you to, to guarantee that you can unravel it later. Right? And so it's the arithmetic is extremely confusing at first, and in part it's because we, or, you know, explicitly is because we're not used to dealing with uh, modular arithmetic. We're not used to dealing with this thing where you wrap around or where you, you compute using the remainder of division. Like usually that was just some annoyance and we have some mixed fractions or, or improper fractions or whatever uh, because of, of that ugly remainder we can't make it nice and clean but in terms of cryptography encryption and decryption asymmetric encryption um, modular arithmetic that remainder in the division operator turns out to be the thing that enables it all uh, and a principle part in understanding that is understanding equivalence relations. So uh, first time through for me, I completely ignored this. It's like, okay, so we're just saying that two things are equal. Well, uh, no, <laughs> they're equivalent, right? So if you're dividing by seven, then uh, two and nine are in an equivalence relation with each other. They both have a remainder of two. And then, you know, uh, if seven was one of the prime numbers that we were dealing with, then all of the operations would be equivalent if you acted on the on two or nine. So they're in an equivalence class together, uh, along with everything else that has a remainder of two. Uh, whenever, whenever you take the modulus with respect to seven. Uh, okay, so this is uh, is by definition right. It's extremely subtle, but it turns out to be extremely important if you want to understand cryptography. Uh, okay. So definition. Two elements A and B are related by an equivalence relation uh, are called equivalent, right? The, not the notation A relates to B is often used to denote that A and B are equivalent elements with respect to a particular equivalence relation. Uh, okay, so let R be, uh, or I guess this would be A is similar to B, right? but either way. Uh, let R be an equivalence relation on some set A, and then the, then the set of all elements that are related to an element A in our set A, little a in our set A, is called the equivalence class of A. So the equivalence class of A with respect to R is denoted by this, right? So the equivalence class of A with respect to R. When only one relation is under consideration, we can delete the subscript R and write A for this equivalence class. Right? Uh, okay, so uh, so going back to the remainder when taking the modulus with respect to uh, some prime number. Oh yeah, members of an equivalence class are known as representatives. Right? Uh, so typically, like whenever you're dealing with remainders, so in the case where we're dividing by seven or taking the modulus the remainder when dividing by seven. Um, then you would see seven of these equivalence classes. So either there's a remainder of zero, it divides perfectly into seven. There's a remainder of one, there's a remainder of two, there's a remainder of three, there's a remainder of four, there's a remainder of five, or there's a remainder of six. 
there is no remainder of 7 because if there was then it was it uh, 7 divided it perfectly and so there's a remainder of 0 so then there's those 7 equivalence classes or uh, in abstract algebra you would call them uh, congruence classes or conjugacy classes or whatever right? um, and so in that case if it's understood that it's modulo 7 then you drop this subscript right? Uh, and you would use the the principal representative uh, so in this case 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 right? uh, so for example there are n equivalence classes when using the modulo operator with respect to n where n is some natural number. Right? For example, n equals 4, there are the following equivalence classes. So, divides perfectly, remainder 1, 2, or 3. And you can see how everything would break down. All integers, positive and negative, would fit into one of these four categories, right? one of these four equivalence classes. So, the equivalence classes of the relation congruence modulo m are called the congruence classes modulo m. So the above results could be generalized by the notation uh, a the equivalence class of a modulo m, right? Okay. Uh, all right. So now let R be an equivalence relation on the set A. So this is a theorem. Then these statements uh, for elements A and B of set A are equivalent. So A relates to B, uh, A and B, the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. Uh, and the intersection of the equivalence class of A and B is not equal to the empty set. Uh, so because they are related, right, they are equivalent, uh, then they're going to be Right, and R is an equivalence relation, uh, then A relates to B. We're going to say that they're equivalent or that their classes are equivalent. So before we said that um, like whenever we were dealing with the remainders of 4, right, we used the example of 2. So you could use 2 here uh, or you could say 6 modulo 4, right? and that's the same class as 2, so their classes are equivalent. Right? Uh, and then uh, that their intersection is not equal to the empty set. Um, so otherwise, uh, I mean, A and B have to be in one of the equivalence classes. And if they're equivalent and their intersection is not equal to the empty set, then, uh, then they're in the same class. So uh, <laughs> this is very subtly telling you that either, um, uh, rather, that these classes are disjoint you every number fits into exactly one of these and it makes sense whenever you think about division and remainders uh, so there's no number divided by four which has both a remainder of one and a remainder of two it's it's going to be in only one of these okay? so there is no overlap between these classes okay uh, so partition a uh, partition of a set S is a collection of disjoint, non-empty subsets of S that have S as their union. So we just saw an example of a partition, right? So the modulus operator uh, divides the natural numbers, or equivalent, or you know, alternatively the integers, uh, into a disjoint collection of non-empty subsets, right? Based on the remainder, whenever dividing by that particular number. Uh, and so, uh, and so that is a partition of the integers or the natural numbers. Okay. Uh, so theorem: Let R be an equivalence relation on some set S. Uh, then the equivalence classes of R form a partition of S. Yeah. Uh, so everything fits into one of the equivalence classes, right? So. That's an example of a partition. Uh, conversely, given a partition uh, where we have AI, these are you know, subsets of S, um, then there is an equivalence relation 
R that has the sets AI, where I is just one of the integrals or whatever that is used to define this, uh, as its equivalence classes. So we say that uh, whenever you have an equivalence relation, it breaks everything down perfectly. It has sensory, right? and, and this uh, is used over and over again in, in abstract algebra. Uh, and so uh, whenever you're identifying subgroups from some parent group or some root group, uh, then uh, you'll have all of these members from the parent group that behave in such a way that they obey some other group's properties. And then, uh, and, and it is always, uh, it includes the, the identity. In the case of a multiplicative group, it always includes one. Right? In the case of an additive group, it always includes zero. Uh, so the identity ends up in that subgroup. And then uh, some other number, right, um, which behaves perfectly as well, right? So, uh, for example, uh, if you were to take all of the numbers that, um, uh, so if you were to take the remainders of uh, 12, right, division modulo 12, so then you have a remainder of 0 all the way up to a remainder of 11. Uh, well, the multiples of 3 are going to be a subset of those which were a remainder of 12, uh, and then Additionally, there are going to be other values in there that uh, were not a multiple of three, right? So multiples of four uh, and multiples of eight, which are not also multiples of 12, right? Uh, so, uh, so you have this perfect division, like you can partition it even further, right? And you have some stuff which fits perfectly, you know, still divides perfectly into 12, uh, and then um, whenever you do that, there are some outliers, and so you've you've broken it a little bit. So there's the perfect part, and then everything else, the the junk or the other conjugacy classes. Um, anyway, uh, and so this says that uh, that you can uh, go in the one direction. You can have uh, some equivalence relation R on a set, uh, and then that will give you a partition or you can be given a partition and then you know that there is some equivalence relation that will satisfy it, uh, even if it's not clear what that relation is to begin with. Right? Uh, okay, so that's by theorem. So uh, partial orderings, um, what is this? All right, yeah, let's run through it if we can. Okay, uh, partial orderings, uh, they are interesting, and then especially if you're going to deal with group theory, uh, it's, uh, it, it gives you a new kind of construct called a lattice, uh, which is a type of graph. It's uh, like a tree, but not. <laughs> uh, so a tree, uh, any two elements are, are path connected by some unique path, any two members of that tree or nodes on that tree. Uh, and so if you consider a file system and you're navigating by command line, uh, rather than explicitly giving the path, if you had to go up a directory, so dot dot slash dot dot or whatever, then you go up the tree and then you go back down and so forth, then uh, the way you get from one path to another, if you exclude the dot operator, right, the, the self-referential uh, dot, then, uh, then that path is unique to get from one place to another. Uh, but in a lattice, it is not unique. Um, so as I was mentioning, you have all of these partitions. Uh, and then in abstract algebra, you study groups and subgroups and their relations or whatever. And so you start with uh, some uh, root group, like the, the symmetry group. Uh, and then the <laughs> uh, a subgroup to everything is um, the remainder when dividing by one. So the cyclic group of one element or whatever. And so it's a, this trivial group, but it's a subgroup of everything else. And so you split that parent group up into, or you know, it'll divide into the alternating group. And then the alternating group will divide into all of these other things. 
uh, and then um, and then so it fans out and then it kind of all comes back together uh, at the that trivial group um, so it's a, a little hard to describe without a, a visual but I don't think it's worth the time whenever we're, we're running low um, well yeah let me give you the visual and we'll finish this off next time Okay. Uh, okay, so you have the symmetry group or the permutation group, uh, which uh, I believe was originally defined uh, to describe how um, how many distinct definitions there are uh, whenever you start alternating the sign of the roots I think in uh, whenever you're trying to compute um, or you're trying to factorize some polynomial right so you have all of the, the zeros uh, multiplied together right so you have them separated out and then you start alternating the sign uh, so this kind of counts the different ways that you can do that uh, and then the output of that um, is uh, the same whenever you alternate an even number of signs, right? So if you flip one sign, then you've changed the value of the function. But if you flip two signs, the, the sign of two different zeros, um, then you end up in the alternating group. And so essentially you get this even odd parity and it applies to so much more than polynomials, which is this it is just how it originally arose the first time that it was studied. Uh, but um, you know, it, there's lots of other cases where, if you're trying to orient some space and it is an orientable space, so yeah, like some even number of dimensions, uh, then uh, or yeah, uh, essentially, uh, so you could define up and down or whatever. Um, then it turns out that you you tend to only have two distinct um, uh, orientations, right? Uh, and if you're in one orientation or another, uh, if you flip two signs, and you end up back <laughs> where you started, right? Uh, and so it's uh, it, it's um, a little loopy at first, right? It seems like you should be able to branch out more than that, uh, but basically not. Uh, and so the alternating group is essentially composed of the, the members of this where you performed two uh, permutative acts uh, and uh, they cancel each other out in terms of sign. Uh, and then this will have, you know, whatever, it, it'll have groups, it'll have cyclic groups for whatever the factors of N are. Uh, and, you know, they, uh, those are the same as the, uh, the, conjugacy classes for division by some number, right? So division by four, division by seven, whatever the remainder is for that. Right? And so you can get all this additional structure whenever you start talking about groups and so forth. So we'll say that there's at least those three subgroups, right? Uh, and then uh, and then there's that trivial group at the bottom. So you can see that this isn't a tree, right? Because this one, if we were to call it a tree, then it would have three parents. Uh, and in a tree structure, there's only one parent, right? There's only one way to get back to the root. Right? So this is a latest, uh, which is a a type of graph, um, but it also has uh, this concept of ordering, or at least partial ordering. And so uh, you can say that these these are all subsets of this, but they don't relate to one another. They they have no actual relation to one another. So you can't relate every pair in a lattice. Right? You only have this partial ordering. But you can relate going up. So if there is a relation, then whichever one is lower, you know, is a subset. Right. 
that you have that subset, you know, that, that partial ordering operator. Uh, and the notation we'll use is actually a placeholder, and so it can be less than or equal to or whatever, or it can be the subset. Uh, but it's this generic, you know, placeholder that looks like less than or equal to. Uh, okay, so we will uh, <laughs> discuss this later. I know this is kind of a bit of a tangent, so I figured I'd end on it. So, um, you know, those of you that are interested can look at it a little bit more, and those of you that aren't uh, can get to work on forgetting <laughs> that you ever saw it. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, remember to finish up the exams and, and get those in uh, before Thursday, uh, and then I will speak to you all on Thursday. Have a good evening.